what the heck was that? We'll talk about it in a second. Uh, hi, folks. Uh, we're back live for the third time, I think. Hopefully, it'll go a little bit smoother <laughs> as I gradually figure out how to all do this stuff. So, uh, today, I want to talk about failure uh, uh, and not just doing it, although I have plenty of that, but avoiding it and the consequences <laughs> of that as well. So, all right, let's just get into it. Uh, um, all right, so what were we just looking at? Uh, it, it was <clears throat> what I'm calling level two plate. What is level two plate? Well, of course, it's plate that's made out of other plates. If a normal plate is made out of individual atoms, a level two plate, each what had been an individual atom, is now a whole subplate. And what we were seeing in the opening demo is uh, the uh, L2 plates were kind of fighting with each other about space, and so they were uh, the, L, the L1 plates, the, the plate plates that we've been using for the last couple of months, uh, uh, <coughs> were blowing up because they were seeing inconsistencies with each other. But then L2, the L2 plate was healing up by reseeding uh, new L1 plates within it. Uh, um, and yeah, <laughs> it, it didn't. It's not working very well yet. Uh, um, <clears throat> just for example, uh, uh, so the, these plates here, um, uh, they were originally surrounding uh, a little atom deck, you know, from like three months ago or something. Uh, um, and the atom decks were dying for reasons I don't understand. Uh, but furthermore, the level two plate surrounding those things was supposed to be a three by three level two plate. So it should, ha should have had nine uh, um, uh, atom decks, each of them surrounded by this new L2 plate stuff. Uh, um, and it's clearly messed up. <laughs> They're going all over the place. I don't know why that's happening as of yet. This is all pretty, pretty new. This stuff down here, uh, um, these are our ASCII plates, uh, the same things that we're using in the side demos to display the uh, function value scores that are coming back. That's also supposed to be 3x3, three three, and that actually does a pretty good job managing to stay 3x3, three three, except it gets invaded uh, by the cancerous little plates. So very early, you know, lots of problems. And why? build L2 plates at all. And the idea is um, to embrace failure. Uh, um, and let's circle around to this. Uh, well, so there's this philosophical question like, are we li is our universe a simulation or is it real? Uh, uh, you know, put the actual philosophy parts of it uh, aside and just say from a practical point of view, what it looks like to me is that <clears throat> in a simulation, you can control the failures. You, you might you might not, you might make life difficult for yourself, but you don't have to. So there's always a slippery slope towards uh, just having, you know, nice errors. Uh, um, um, and the serious question is, when you're uh, with reality, you have to deal with the actual errors that you've got. Uh, um, and so, you know, we're talking about robust first computing here, right, for ages. Uh, um, and that leads to this fundamental question about robust to what kind of errors. Because, you know, when you're focusing on correctness, uh, uh, there, you know, at least in simple cases, the, it, it's clear what correct means. And once you hit correct, you know, exactly down to the bit correct, then you're done. And uh, now you can focus on efficiency. And that's our traditional computing story. But once you admit that mm, there's going to be underlying failures, the hardware's not going to be deterministic, you're going to have to deal with something. Now you have this fundamental question. You say, well, okay, but what kind of errors does my robust first computer computing need to be able to handle? And the answer is, well, it needs to handle whatever kinds of errors actually occur, but that couples the abstract computing to whatever physical implementation you may be dealing with. And implementation one might have different kind of errors than implementation two. But in general, across implementations, I, you know, my experience is there's, there's nice errors and there's nasty errors. And, and you know, nice errors are small individual pieces cleanly vanishing, poof, gone. 
Uh, um, and the nasty errors are when things, you know, like they don't completely disappear, but they get corrupted internally. Uh, uh, and, you know, rather than just, you know, becoming empty space or disappearing entirely, it turns into a twisted version of something that actually makes sense, something that will tra trip you into trusting it to actually exist. So for our purposes specifically, uh, uh, what about tectons, you know? the key aspect of the plate tectonics that at number one an individual plate is tightly coupled that you know there's stuff that can depend on coordinates and sizes inside there and we've gotten a lot of leverage out of that but in addition we have the ability to make it movable and growable by passing tectons through it to move it all one the other direction or to leave a new line behind and have it get bigger well, what happens if we get a tecton failure uh, uh, in the middle of a plate? And, you know, I've thought about this quite a bit. And fundamentally, the answer is the plate has to die. Because, you know, in fact, the way tectons work is the plate, you know, as a tecton moves through a plate, the, the area around the tecton is essentially under local anesthesia. That's the way we've designed it. So, you know, if you see a tecton, on, you just fall asleep like one of those sleeping goat things uh, uh, and as a result you never notice that parts of the plate on the other side of the tecton in fact are inconsistent with you because the part that's behind the tecton has already had its size or position updated whereas the part ahead of the tecton has not a and so the fact that the tecton causes the plate to go to sleep as it moves through is what makes the trick work but now what if the tecton you know gets a failure that means it's gone or a piece of it's gone or the whole thing unwinds now we have this whole fracture down the middle of the plate what are we going to do about it you know and you know i've thought about this a lot on and off and i've thought about this a lot in the last couple of weeks uh, um and for sure we could maybe armor the tecton harder you know it could possibly be a two row a two level row moving through although that causes other problems uh, um or some various forms of additional redundancy to help tectons avoid you know, evil kirk failures you know where you end up with a gap in the tecton line that you don't know where where to put it in should i heal it down down here or heal it over here or heal it here it makes a difference or worse now we have two uh, uh, the good Kirk and the evil Kirk on the same line and we need to decide what to do about it in any event it seems that because we were counting on the plate being a relatively area of consistency if there's a tecton failure the whole plate has to die uh, whereas L2 plates made out of L1 plates uh, um, the okay so it's the L1 plate the, the tectons are not moving across the entire L2 plate the L2 plate does not move by tectons the L2 plate moves if it does if once we get it debugged uh, by having tectons move through the individual L1 plates inside so the whole thing can kind of oogie along and that means if there's a tecton failure it's going to take out a single L1 plate like a loss of a site in the level one plate in the regular plates that we've got and so the l2 plate is designed to heal up by looking from the neighbors and saying oh look there ought to be a l2 plate there because i'm level two coordinate one two so there should be a one one l2 plate above me and it goes ahead and seeds one based on the contents of itself um and and that's kind of weird and it requires some thought on what you put in an l2 plate but that's okay, uh, um, and it heals up. So that's the key. And what that means is the small is beautiful. That whereas before we had been thinking about, boy, you know, the plates, the regular L1 plates that we've been dealing with, the way that I tend to implement them, you know, as far as the bit budgets go, they tend to top out at around a hundred and a quarter by a hundred and a quarter uh, in terms of number of sites. And, you know, you could imagine wanting to go much, much bigger, but um, th that is already something that if we have a weird uh, failure, a real tectonic failure, you lose 120 
125 by 125, that's going to take a long time to recover. It, you know, you have to rebuild from whatever that thing was doing. Whereas by saying we're going to limit ourselves to smaller plates and force us to move to level two, where the individual plates are going to, the sites are going to die, but we're going to communicate between them. They're going to heal up. Small is beautiful. So that's the reason for the L2 plates. We just got to get them working a little better. All right, uh, let me switch cameras here. Uh, uh, all right, we've got our desktop 3x3 three three grid. I'm going to actually boot it up from cold here since we haven't seen this in quite some time. And we've had some, yeah, some new folks joining the channel that, you know, may, may never have actually seen this at all or certainly haven't seen it live. <laughs> Uh, uh, and the boot process, you know, it still takes uh, uh, 90 seconds or something like that. Uh, but uh, um, we can actually, let's see, can I do this? Uh, no, not that one. Not that uh, there. That's the one we want. So we've got the serial cable plugged into the middle uh, in, of this ring, uh, um, and so we can watch the thing booting up. And and this is just a you know typical insofar as anything is typical uh, Linux boot process. Uh, let's go back to. Uh, all right, so we'll see this uh, once these guys uh, start to heat up. Once they get far enough into the boot that they can light up the screen. <sighs> then we'll get going. Uh, so the, the there, there we go. So the screen comes up. Once the screen is up, then the MFM T2 engine is getting started. This is actually just a splash screen. Uh, now the engine is going to start. Uh, um, and come on, you can do it. Uh, uh, oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, um, and we are running a new version of the ca cache traffic stress tester that I wrote way back when to try to trigger those problems that were happening very intermittently on the grid as a whole. Uh, uh, so here we are, and we can uh, look at the tile now. I mean, I have terrible problems. I'm just using uh, an old one of my webcam to, to shoot this, and it looks awful. Uh, we can We can zoom in a little bit. But it still looks awful. <laughs> uh, uh, so I apologize for that. We've got to figure out a better way to uh, record these things, but step by step. Uh, um, well, so all right. So let's let's do one demo a little here. Uh, we'll go back to the overall view. So suppose I uh, have this uh, tile just crash. Uh, I'll simulate a, a crash myself, and we'll see what happens to the rest of them. Uh, uh, all right, so there, user requested failure. That's the only kind of failure that we consider acceptable. And the engine automatically restarts. We saw that the neighbor closed the connection, and now it's opening up again. And uh, it, you can see that the, the connections uh, northwest and southwest have closed, and now they've opened again, and it all recovered fine. So that seems great. But the only reason that that worked was because there was nothing going on in the universe. So if if we actually seed the universe with uh, a uh, cache traffic stress tester, which we will do, uh, um, boom. Okay, the way the cache traffic stress tester works is it, it fills, every time we get an event, we essentially take all of the sites that we can reach, the 40 sites that we can reach, and increment a counter in all of them, which forces the underlying MFM T2 engine. If the uh, event is near an edge, uh, uh, it means it's going to have to transmit the maximum amount of information uh, across to the neighboring tiles to let them know that all of these sites have changes. Uh, um, so now, uh, if we try to do the same thing, if we, you know, like crash this tile, uh, uh, well, first off, here, here, look at this. So now when we have, uh, you can see the, the traffic going through here. It's, it's really pounding uh, a, a lot. Uh, um, but here we go. Now we'll crash it. User requested failure. Ba-boom, ba-boom. There you go. Nice, huh? <laughs> we, took, we took out the entire grid. Uh, um, and, and the reason is, as we've talked about on and off in the past, is once we have a bunch of events in progress, the, for, to, in order to get whatever little uh, um, uh, efficiencies, well, that's, that's what it is, uh, um, that we can have, 
uh, we e each tile is a bit has the ability to have like uh, 16 or 32 events going simultaneously that involve neighboring tiles and so they wait to get packets that are labeled for them until they can advance that uh, uh, event and once it's done and the cash is to be exchanged then it gets committed and so forth and once it works fine and you know this is an advantage of the fact that an event window is so circumscribed it means you know we know that as long as the changes fit inside this event window we can have a whole bunch of other ones going elsewhere and there's there's no interference between them as long as something doesn't go wrong in the substrate as long as packets don't get lost or a tile uh, disappears uh, um, but once we had all that stuff going as we did uh, um, well, let's go back to sites uh, display sites now we're doing the flash traffic commands this is where we send traffic to the grid uh, uh, that uh, tells everybody to do it using the special flash traffic channel that we implemented uh, um, and now once again we can seed uh, the the stress tester and off we go. Uh, um, so the point is, is when one of these guys crashes and all these other ones have dozens of events partially in flight, they don't know what to do about it. And they don't know what to do about it because I don't know what to do about it. Uh, what it all comes down to is that we are going to have user visible failures, where user means the, the Ulam programmer level, where the, you know, Ulam signs up to say, I'm going to try to provide you best effort deterministic execution. If your event starts and you're there and you decide what to do and you make your changes, the underlying engine will make its best effort to make sure that those engines those changes get distributed consistently to everywhere they need to go. And the challenging part is when it needs to go intertile. Uh, and we've got that working lots, but we, we do not and we cannot have it working 100% of the time. Because, you know, the damn neighboring tile is a separate uh, device. You know, it can be pulled out and, and, and dealt with separately. So there will be failures and they're going to have to propagate up to the user visible program level. And we don't have any semantics for that. We don't know how to tell the Ulam level that, you know, sorry, I promise it's going to be deterministic. It's not. Uh, um, so that's where we were you know, months and months ago, and that's where I went and just left it, you know, it, you know, because, it, you know, it's not like the tile is so important. The tile is in service of the sites, and we would love it if the sites could always have guaranteed success, guaranteed deterministic events, but we can't guarantee that. We know that. So... <sighs> The goal for this update was to get my head back into the tile code and deal with it and try to start mapping out how we're going to decide what to do. And when I started two weeks ago, I was thinking that the issue, the work for me was going to be to say, oh, look at the Linux kernel code and the communication processor code and figure out where the bug might be. But then I gradually realized that's really not it. What has to be decided is how to present failure how to embrace the failure and present it to the uh, next level of the software in whatever form will do the least amount of damage to them. And that's what led to me making the L2 plate uh, uh, to say, you know, we, we've been sneakily, because we've had deterministic events, we've been having the, the plates getting bigger and bigger and bigger, doing more and more stuff in it. We feel like it's really cool. But now here comes reality. Here comes the grid saying, okay, you know, there's going to be failures that are going to cause entire plates to blow up. And they're only going to blow up because we wrote software. We, you know, and this is part of what's been in plates from the beginning. There's, a, there's the two death bits inside each element of plate that says, you know, when something's gone wrong, take out the whole plate, take out my sub plates, take out the super plates, four different combinations of how to die. That has been key to understanding what's going on. All right. So Let's leave this uh, for now. Uh, uh, have we got time? Uh, we're taking up a lot of time. Uh, um, uh, we can go back uh, over here. Can I uh, maybe show you a little bit about... Uh, uh, okay, yeah. Let's just real quick. 
So now we are talking to the middle tile on this thing, and uh, I, I wrote a new program this week. T T T T tile base apps p view. Uh, um, th this is just to give us a view on how the how much packet traffic is moving in and out of whatever tile we're looking at. So we have a row. Uh, you know, wherever it is, uh, northeast, east, southeast, southwest, and west. MFM is the engine traffic. That's the most important stuff. Uh, BLK, that's bulk. That's for updating the CDM, the common data manager packages. And then this is just the sum of them over here. Uh, um, and so, you know, we're doing something like... Uh, 75, you know, depending on things, you know, it, it gets hot in here. The processors slow down. What are, we, what are we running at here? Oh, we're still running at one gig. That's as fast as these things can go. Uh, um, uh, and we're doing something like 70 packets, 80 packets. Uh, th that'll climb up to about 90 packets a second in and out in all six directions. Uh, in this case, because we're in the middle uh, tile, so that's fully connected all the way around. Uh, um, and, you know, is that pitiful? <laughs> you know, compared to what? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else has ever done this, uh, um, you know, in, in these specific design constraints. Uh, uh, so who knows? And so it's doing uh, five, five to six uh, kilobytes a second, which seems pretty pitiful, both input and output in each of six directions. And, you know, I would love that to be megabytes uh, uh, or at least hundreds of kilobytes and this is really the I still think the single biggest thing that's going to limit the t2 tiles a aer average event rate uh, um, in the end is, is 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 just our raw communication speed and we'd love to look forward to a t3 tile that using some differential signals that could go much much faster than all of this but again the point is spring the bear traps see what kind of failures we've got you know yeah look at this uh, uh friday october 9th you know why is that going on why is that going on because the, the middle tiles anything except for the tiles along the west edge they never see the network so they can't run network time they have no idea what time it is <laughs> and uh, that that's a feature once again because you know assuming the existence of coordinated global time is another form of synchronization another form of coupling systems together that we don't want to do uh, uh, okay well anyway so that's that that's the packet viewer and we also have and then I will stop uh, sys class ITC packet the new one is FIFOs. Yeah, okay. Uh, um, and the important point here, the last two rows, the last two columns, C drop and T drops is, is recording packet drops that the uh, uh, Linux kernel module had to toss stuff because it didn't have room in a buffer when a packet was coming through. C drops is current drops since the last time we looked at this uh, FIFO file. T drops is the total number uh, of drops that we've had since the thing booted or this was reset and you know the last number is all zero and you know that means we haven't seen any at all now when i distribute new packages uh the bulk channels the bulk outbound uh, um and uh the two of them because there's two coprocessors the each coprocessor covers three of the neighbors uh, we see bulk outbound packets dropped, uh, um, but I was prepared for that, and the common data manager has retry logic built into it. Uh, I have not yet caught a uh, priority outbound or uh, uh, MFM in inbound uh, dealing with the specific uh, buffers coming in. But uh, we've got a, a better way to see it. We also have uh, improved tracing in MFMT2, which seems to be working a little bit better here. So that's a start, uh, uh, step by step. Okay, so we are re-entering the grid. Um, and... Uh, Embracing failure. So I've already talked about this. And I'm taking a lot of time, so I'll skip over it. But yeah, you know, the 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 hallmark of it is how big are the plates? 
those things are tightly coupled that uh, do not have necessarily a lot of redundancy above the level of size and position of each atom within the plate. And so once the size and position become inconsistent, we're in trouble. Uh, uh, but hey, uh, uh, robust first computing, you know, at some level, because of the fact that we were doing distributed limited stuff, we were doing some of that. But now we're taking it to the next level, robust finally. Uh, uh. Okay, uh, so uh, that's about it. Uh, the goal for today was to get back in, into the into the tiles. Did that? Uh, uh, did program the stuff? New Sisyphus file, curled displayers. We saw that. Uh, the other thing was for this time was Ulam Five release preparations. Did some of that too. And and you know, folks, if anybody is out there, I mean, there aren't very many Ulam programmers in the universe. And I love you, fucks. <laughs> For, for even trying. Uh, um, but some folks have actually built pretty substantial code. I don't know if anybody's really working on their code now, but in the past, people have worked on fairly substantial stuff. I am considering, I'm kind of committed to making a breaking change in C2D. That's the package, the standard library for dealing with two dimensional coordinates uh, to deal with multiplication of coordinates. Because the way I had it designed was that the multiplication of two coordinates produced an integer and it did the dot product which you know does the this times this plus this times that and comes back with a, a scalar value and especially as i've been doing the the plate stuff i never want that i almost never want that and instead i want the multiplication of two chords to do multiply the x's multiply the y's and give me back a chord with the result so I'd love to hear discussion about it. I brought it up on the, the chat, on the Gitter, and if anybody's got any issues, let, you know, please let me know, but I'm probably going to do it otherwise. The goal for the next update, number one, I want Ulam code to actually see an event fail somehow. I mean, at the very least, it'll just get an inconsistent result. You know, we'll have an evil tecton twin or something like that uh, that actually happened. Or perhaps if we could do something smarter, we will. And to get Ulam 5, the code base, building on the canonical build form, that's where you have to send code to make Ubuntu packages that make it easier to do. And last time I tried to do the Ulam 5 on the canonical build form, which was over a year ago now, I couldn't get it to build. Let's figure out what that's about. Uh, oh, and we've got yet another version of Psi. I will just show that rather than explain the details. I think you'll get the idea. Uh, um, and uh, we'll end with that. Uh, uh, is Which one? Uh, closer. Where the heck is the closer here? Uh, um, and now I've completely lost. I, I can't find my... All right, here we go. Thanks for coming, folks. Uh, uh, sorry I went so long. got another improvement. <laughs> yeah, um, all right. Um, uh, so that's it. See you next time.